Hello everyone and welcome back. For the next two classes, we're going to be working on the most important computational tool for homology groups. It's called the Meyer Viatoris sequence and it lets you compute the homology of a big space in terms of the homology of subspaces it's broken up into. So the Meyer Viatoris sequence involves a bit of algebraic machinery that takes some getting used to. So this class will be focused on the algebraic aspect of what we need to understand the Meyer Viatoris sequence. And the next class will be focused on the more geometric aspects, as well as the proof of the theorem and some quick applications. So let's get to it. So here's our goal. I have a space X broken up into two open subspaces, U and V. So with this decomposition comes some inclusions, which we've seen before for Van Kampen's theorem. Uh, the intersection of U and V includes into U and includes into V. And likewise, U includes into X and V includes into X. So given this setup, we're going to define a map called boundary star. This is called a connecting homomorphism. The, these kinds of maps show up all the time in mathematics. And it's going to connect the nth level homology to the n minus 1th level homology. So there's a map boundary star from hn of x into hn minus 1 of the intersection. And it's going to make the following sequence exact. We'll define what exact means. That's going to be the focus of today's class. But nevertheless, we're going to get this sequence of uh, homomorphisms of abelian groups. So I have the inclusion maps uh, in homology. So that's I star and J star. And I also have these inclusion maps K star and L star in homology. And all of these maps are going to fit together in this nice way. So let's get into what an exact sequence is. So uh, for now, I'll just talk about an exact sequence of abelian groups uh, and homomorphisms. So a sequence of homomorphisms A n plus 1, this will map by alpha n plus 1 down to a n, and that'll map by alpha n down to a n minus 1, and so on and so forth. So coming in here will be something like alpha n plus 2, and coming out of here will be something like alpha n minus 1, is said to be exact if, for all n, the kernel of alpha n is exactly equal to the image of alpha n plus 1. Uh, and sometimes we don't get exactly this for all n, but we say it's exact. So we say the sequence is exact at a i. Uh, so at at this level, like a n, there's the map coming in, a n plus one, and the map coming out, a n. And if we have the requirement there, so uh, the kernel of alpha i is equal to the image of alpha i plus one. So we're just exact at this location. Uh, so this looks a lot like what we've seen before. It looks like the chain complex requirement, but it's not exactly that. Remember, a chain complex is one in which the kernel is contained in the image, right? In fact, it's sort of, uh, we like chain complexes because you can define homology. Uh, so these are chain, com these are chain complexes with no homology. So zero homology at every level, the exact ones. So as a philosophical point, what homology measures 
the homology of a chain complex, it measures the failure of a chain complex to be exact. So many familiar uh, setups, like relations, can be expressed as exact sequences. For example, um, if I have 0 goes into A, goes into B, if this is exact, that means that alpha is injective, right? Because it's telling me the kernel of alpha is the image of the zero map, aka the kernel is just zero, and so the map is injective. Now what happens if we put the zero on the other side? Well, this means that uh, alpha is surjective, right? So this is saying that uh, here's the zero map. <laughs> the uh, the kernel of that zero map, aka everything, is the image of the map coming in. So the map coming in is surjective, uh, and so if you combine these two. That means that alpha is an isomorphism. And here's a setup that we'll be working with more in the future. Zero goes into A, goes into B, goes into C goes into zero. Uh, so let's just say what this means. Well, alpha is injective by what we said before. Beta is surjective. And so if you use the first isomorphism theorem for any surjective map, uh, oh, of course, this, this is with the kernel of beta is equal to the image of alpha. So I have a surjective map. I know what its kernel is. And so I get C is exactly B mod the image of A, which you could think of it as just being uh, B mod A. So this represents a quotient sort of relation here. And an exact sequence like the one and four is called a short exact sequence. We'll be using these a lot, and so I'll be calling them SESs. Uh, so this is meant to mimic the setup zero goes into A, goes into A direct sum C, goes into C, goes into zero. So this is the inclusion map, and this is the projection map. So you should think of, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a mental crutch. It's not exactly true. I'll show you an example where it's not true, but roughly, Think of it as the middle term is built out of the two side terms in some way. Uh, so, like I said, this is not always the case. For example, here's a short exact sequence. Uh, I have z mod 2z, uh, and I can 
include this into Zmod 4Z by one gets sent to two. These are cyclic groups, so homomorphism is determined by where I send one. If I send one to two, I get an injective map. And now I can surject this onto Zmod 2Z by uh, one goes to one. And the kernel of this map, the first map, is the, uh, sorry, the kernel of the second map is the image of the first map. And so this is indeed a short exact sequence. But of course, Zmod 4Z is not equal to Zmod 2Z direct sum Zmod 2Z, right? There's order four elements inside there. So, uh, but roughly you could think of Zmod 4Z as built out of two pieces of Zmod 2Z, is the idea. Okay, so let's just soup this up a little bit. Uh, but first let's recall that a chain map F from a chain complex C star with the boundary map boundary C to D star boundary D is a map which first of all respects the levels of the complex. That is F of CN lies entirely inside of DN for all N and if I do, okay, so I can shoot over with F, and then I'm living in D, so I can do boundary D, and this is equal to F composed with boundary C. So there's a notion of a short exact sequence for these as well. So if C star, D star, and E star are chain complexes, Then a sequence of chain maps uh, C star to F, uh, sorry, D star to E star. So C star will map to D star by F, and D star will map to E star by G. And this is exact if each of the sequences CP maps by F to DP maps by G to EP is exact. So chain, this is uh, a chain complex of groups. And let's just go ahead, we lose nothing by calling them abelian groups. And so it just basically means that each level, this thing is exact. All right, so strap in. We're, we're going to uh, have our first argument that constitutes what's called a diagram chase. Uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to draw a huge diagram and then we're going to like follow our way through it and construct something in the end. So before I do that, I'm just gonna need some notation before uh, setting everything down so that I, I'm not writing forever. Uh, if C is some element, uh, if C is some chain, uh, and boundary of C is equal to zero, I'm just gonna call C in HP of C be the homology class. All right. So here is a lemma, and it tells you how to construct these connecting homomorphisms in homology. It's called the zigzag lemma. All right, so first of all, I'm gonna start 
with a short exact sequence of chain complexes. So C maps to D, maps to E, is a short exact sequence. of chain maps then for each P there is what we call a connecting homomorphism boundary star and it goes from HP of E star to HP minus 1 of C star such that the following sequence is exact. Uh, so this is basically what we wrote down before boundary star comes into HP of C star and now I'll have this map in homology it's a f is a chain map and we showed before that chain maps induce maps on homology so I have this map f star uh, that goes to HP of D star which comes down by G star to HP of E star and then I'll have this map again boundary star down to H P minus 1 of C star. And this goes on forever. So sometimes a sequence like this is called a long exact sequence to distinguish it from a short exact sequence. So what the zigzag lemma does is you feed it a short exact sequence of chain complexes and it returns you a long exact sequence of the homology. So be careful, this isn't defined on the chain level necessarily. All right. Uh, so now let me write that down. So this is called, let's put a definition in the lemma. Uh, the long exact sequence associated to a short exact sequence. So I'm not going to do this whole proof, but I'm going to try to hit some highlights here because the, the whole proof is would be very con time consuming. Uh, so consider the following diagram. Which I drew ahead of time in order to save a little time here. So this is exactly what I get from F and G being a short exact sequence of chain maps. At each row, at each level, for example, let's just zoom in on on the p plus 1th level. If I go left to right, I have a short exact sequence of groups. And f is a chain map, and so it better uh, this better be commutative. So since f and g are chain maps, it is commutative. And the rows are exact sequences. Okay, so what do I need to do? I need to get from this level down to this level in homology. So I need to get from EP to CP minus 1. So let EP, this is some element of the pth homology, V star. So this be arbitrary. I want to let you know what boundary star of this is going to be, but this is going to take a little bit. Okay. 
Let's get to it. So since G is surjective, uh, there exists a DP and DP so that G of DP is equal to EP. I'm also not going to be drawing parentheses around my function maps. Sorry about that, but that's how it's going to be. So uh, I'll try to keep track of where we are on this diagram, which is going to involve a little bit of scrolling. But I started here with EP. And then I bounced back over to some DP with the property that G maps over there. G maps over to EP. OK. Now, uh, G of the boundary of DP, G is a chain map. So this is boundary of G of DP. But G of DP is EP. And so I have that this is the boundary of EP. But remember, EP is some element of homology. What are elements of homology? They're things which map to zero under the boundary map. So this is zero. OK, so what does this tell me? Boundary of DP is in the kernel of this G map. But the kernel of the G map is the image of F because each row is a short exact sequence. So uh, boundary DP lives down here. And since the kernel, it lies in that kernel of G, we know that there exists some CP minus 1 so that F of CP minus 1 is equal to DP minus 1, or sorry, boundary DP, that's what we call it. OK, so since G of boundary DP was 0, we can pull this back to some element here, CP minus 1. So you can see why this is called the zigzag lemma. We started at EP, we zigzagged our way down. OK, so I want this map to be defined on homology, right? So I need to show that the CP minus 1 is some element of homology. OK, so uh, F of the boundary of CP minus 1 is equal to the boundary of F of CP minus 1, which is, OK, F of CP minus 1 was defined to be the boundary of DP. So this is boundary, boundary, DP. And if you ever do the boundary map twice in a row in a chain complex, you get 0. So now, since F is injective, that's what the zero in front of F means. That means the boundary of CP minus one itself is equal to zero because F of it is equal to zero. So CP minus one uh, represents some element which I'll call CP minus 1, this, in homology. Uh, let me just be more uh, specific. It's HP minus 1 of C star. OK, so what did I do? I started with some element of homology, EP. And I got some element of homology, uh, CP minus 1, in the target where I want. So define the boundary star of EP minus 1 to be equal to this class 
CP minus 1. So that's the definition of this connecting homomorphism. But of course, uh, there's some problems here, which is that I made some choices. Uh, for example, uh, G is surjective, so there exists a DP. This is a choice here. And it could have rippled down to give me some other element, uh, other CP minus one, right? Uh, so this is something I'm gonna brush under the rug. Uh, all choices may change the chain element CP minus one, but do not change the homology element CP minus one. So the map is indeed well defined. All right, but there's another claim, which is that the sequence that we've constructed is exact. So we have maps, boundary star, uh, HP of C star to F star, HP of D star by G star down to HP of E star, and then boundary star down to HP minus one of C star. And we need to show exactness. So it's helpful here if maybe you pull up uh, two copies of this video and pause it on the other screen, or if you have access to the notes, pull up the notes, because I'm going to be referencing the definitions we made back on the other screen. Uh, and in fact, we'll only show exactness at HP of C star. Here, all the other cases are, are very similar. So this will give you the idea of what you need to do. So suppose that uh, CP is equal to the boundary star of EP minus one. So let's remember what exactness means. I need to show that the image of the map coming in is the kernel of the map coming out. So this is some element in the image of the map coming in, and I need to show you that it's in the kernel of the map going out, right? Now, by the definition of uh, boundary star, there is some dp plus 1 with f of cp equal to the boundary of dp plus 1. That's just how we defined it. Again, take a look at the notes. So uh, f of cp, f star in homology of the homology class cp, well, this is if you look at how we defined induced maps on homology, it's f of this chain, cp, in homology, which is the homology class of the boundary of dp plus 1. But if you're the homology class of the boundary map, that means you're in the image of the map coming in, and so this is 0. Okay, so what did we do? We uh, we took this element f. Uh, sorry, we took this element cp, which was in the image of boundary star. We hit it with f, and we showed that we got zero, 
And so what we showed is that uh, the image of boundary star is a subset of the kernel of f star. Okay, now let's prove the converse. So suppose uh, the homology class of f of cp is equal to zero. So this is something in the kernel, and I want to show it's in the image. Okay, now uh, if you're zero in homology, that means you're killed by something in the image. So then there exists Ah, sorry, a dp plus one, so that f of cp is equal to the boundary of dp plus one, right? Now, then the boundary of g of dp plus one this is a chain map. So this is G of the boundary of DP plus one. We defined boundary of DP plus one to be F of CP. So this is G of F of CP. But remember, this is an exact sequence. So I just did two maps in a row. And so this is zero. Well, what does that say? then I'll call this element EP plus one, which is this G of DP plus one. This represents some homology class in uh, HP plus one of E star. And now, let's pull up those definitions again. We defined this EP plus one such that boundary star of EP plus one is equal to uh, this CP plus one, or uh, CP rather, yes. Okay, so I took something in the kernel and then I found something in the image of boundary star that hits it. So uh, we have that the kernel of F star is a subset of the image of boundary star. And so uh, by the reverse inclusion, they're equal. And that's exactly what it means uh, for the sequence to be exact. So the sequence is exact at HP of C star. Uh, there is, we'll scroll up a little bit. It's quite easy to show exactness here at HP of D star. That just comes from the exactness of F and G. And the only really non-trivial fact is exactness at uh, HP of E star, and it's very similar to what we just did. So uh, that's the idea. And now you know how to construct a long exact sequence given a short exact sequence of chain complexes. So I want to do one more of these homological algebra type proofs, uh, or at least one half of one. And this will go in to the proof of the Meyer-Villatoris theorem, but I'm actually gonna brush that part exactly under the rug. Nevertheless, this is something that comes up quite often. So here's the lemma. It's important enough to have its own name called the five lemma. So let AI and BI be groups, say abelian groups, such that the following diagram commutes
and has exact rows. So I'll have A1 mapping by alpha 1 to A2, mapping by alpha 2 to A3, to A4, then to A5. Okay, and I'm going to have a similar setup here. B1, uh, B2, B3, B4, and B5. These are going to maps map by maps <laughs> betas, so beta 2, beta 3, beta 4. And now I'm also going to have a uh, essentially a, like a chain map here, which I'll call F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5. Okay, so rows are exact, doing two in a row. Stronger than that, the, the kernel of each map going out is the image of the map coming in. And now, the conclusion is if F1, F2, F4, and F5 are isomorphisms, then so is F3. There's a little caveat here, which is you could weaken these conditions a little bit. Uh, you only need like, I forget exactly what it is, but like injectivity of F1 and surjectivity of F5. But this is the way it most often comes up and it's the simplest to state. So, uh, the, the big picture is if the maps on the sides are isomorphisms, the map in the middle is an isomorphism. So I'm only, like I mentioned, I'm only gonna prove half of this. Uh, we will prove that F3 is injective. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this so once we lose it, I can refer to it. Uh, okay, so let, uh, oh, <laughs> and I messed up, I'm sorry. I'm gonna prove that F3 is surjective. Great. So let uh, B3 be in big B3, and I want, uh, an A3 and big A3 with F3 of A3 being equal to B3. All right, now let's start working our way through all these assumptions. Since F4 is surjective, there is an A4 with F4 of A4 equal to beta 3 of B3. So we're, uh, we took an A4 up here, we map down here to get F4 of A4, and this needs to equal beta 3 of B3. All right. Uh, now, by commutativity and exactness, what is F5 of alpha 4 of A4? Well, this is the commutativity of the diagram. I'm going to swap these two here. So I'll get uh, beta four of F four of A four. Well, F four of A four was 
defined to be beta 3 of B3. So this is beta 4 of beta 3 of B3. And now I'm in an exact sequence and I did two maps in a row, beta uh, 3 followed by beta 4. And so this needs to be equal to 0. All right. Now, since F5 is injective, it's in particular an isomorphism, right? Uh, alpha 4 of A4 is itself equal to 0. This thing has no kernel, so there you have it. Okay. Now, anytime something's in the kernel, it lies in the image of something else, right? So by exactness, there is an A3 in big A3 so that Uh, alpha 3 of A3 is equal to A4. So it's in the kernel of one map, so it's in the image of the previous map. Okay, now, then, beta 3 of B3, this was defined to be F4 of A4, but now A4 is alpha 3 of A3. So this is F4 of alpha 3 of A3. But now I did an F and then an alpha. This is the same thing as doing a uh, beta and then an F. So keep track of the indices. And it's beta 3 of F3 of A3. So that, okay, now I'm just going to subtract over to the other side. And uh, maybe now I'll copy down this diagram here so we can keep track of it. All right. Uh, if I look at beta 3 of B3 minus F3 of A3, this is equal to zero. I just subtract it over and I use the fact that the map's a homomorphism, right? Okay, uh, so in particular, this is in the uh, kernel of beta three, which is equal to the image of beta two. That's the exactness hypothesis. All right, <laughs> where are we now? Uh, now, uh, so there's some B2 and big B2 with beta 2 of B2 equal to B3 minus F3, A3. But now, by the surjectivity of F2, there exists an A2 in big A2 with B2 equal to F2 of A2. All right, here we are at the end. Uh, then beta 3 minus F3 of A3 is equal to beta 2 of B2, which is equal to this. Now there's something that hits B2, so it's beta 2 of F2 of A2. All right, <laughs> I have a beta and F. I could switch that for an F and then an alpha, that's F3 of alpha 2 of A2. Okay, but now 
What did we do? Be beta <laughs> B3 is the element we started with, right? This is the start. Oops. And I wanted something in A3 which hits it, and there we have it. Uh, it's alpha 2 of A2. So, uh, oops, this is <laughs> B3 minus F3A3 is equal to F3 of A2 alpha 2. Let's just, uh, let me spell this out here. B3 is F3 of A3 plus alpha 2 of A2, which implies that B3 is in the image of F3. I took an arbitrary element and I showed it was in the image and therefore that map is surjective. Great. So, uh, take a breather after that one. Uh, this kind of stuff can be fun, uh, but also easy to get lost in. So if you need if you needed to pause a bunch of times, that's totally fine. So next time we'll come back and this was the algebraic input into the Meyer via torus theorem. Next time we're gonna have a little bit more algebra, but we're also gonna do the geometric part of the Meyer via torus theorem and prove that theorem so we can use it. Thanks and I'll see you again next time.